resumed playing his illegal copy of the Spellbinder's presentation. Each one of you carries a quiet genius and a triumphant hero within your hearts. Dismiss these as idealistic words of an elderly inspirationalist if you wish, but I'm proud to be an idealist. Our world needs more of us. And yet, I am also a realist. And here's the truth. Most people on the planet today don't think much of themselves, unfortunately. They secure their identity by who they are externally. They evaluate their achievement by what they've collected versus by the character they've cultivated. They compare themselves to the orchestrated and fake Highlight reels presented by the people they follow. They measure their self-worth by their net worth. And they get kidnapped by the false thought that because something has never been done, it can't be done. Depleting the grand and electrifying possibilities their lives are meant to become. This explains why the majority is sinking in the quicksand of uncertainty, boredom, distraction, and complexity. Drama mamas, the homeless man interrupted again. That's what I call men and women who've caught the virus of victimitis excusitis. All they do is complain about how bad things are for them, instead of applying their primal power to make things better. They take instead of give, criticize instead of create, and worry instead of work. Build antibodies to combat any form of average from getting anywhere near your professional days at the office— and your private life at home. Never be a drama mama. The entrepreneur and the artist peeked at each other. Then they giggled, both at the terms the quirky stranger was using, and at the way he'd raised an arm and made the fingers of one hand into a peace sign as he spoke the words he'd just shared. If you were standing there with them, you would think he was weird, too. The spellbinder could then be heard speaking the following words on the recording with dramatic flair. To be clear, every day for the rest of your life, you'll be faced with the chance of showing leadership, wherever you are and in all that you do. Leadership isn't just for global icons and marketplace titans. It's an arena everyone gets to play in. Because leadership is a lot less about having a formal title, a large office, and money in the bank, and a lot more about committing to mastery over all you do, and in who you are. It's about resisting the tyranny of the ordinary, refusing to allow negativity to hijack your sense of awe, and preventing any form of slavery to mediocrity from infesting your life. Leadership is about making a difference right where you're planted. Real leadership is about sending out brave work that exemplifies genius, turns your whole field on its head by its scope, innovation, and execution, and is so staggeringly sublime that it stands the test of time. And never work only for the income. Labor for the impact— Make your dominant pursuit the heartfelt release of value that represents an uncommon magic that borders on the poetic. Demonstrate the full-on expression of what's possible for a human being to create. Develop the patience to stick with your dedication to absolute world-class output. Even if over a lifetime you only generate a single masterpiece. To achieve this feat alone will have made your life's journey a worthy trek. Be a virtuoso, a standout, an exceptionalist. The top five percent are a lot less concerned with fame, cash, and approval, and a lot more invested in punching above their weight class within their craft, playing above their pay grade around their talents, and creating the kind of productivity that inspires and serves millions. That's often why they make millions. So never mail it in. Always bring it on. The homeless man now had his eyes closed and was down on the floor doing a series of one-armed push-ups. All the while he was chanting, Own your morning, elevate your life. 
the entrepreneur and the artist shook their heads. One of my favorite books is The Prophet, mused the artist. It's one of the best-selling works of poetry ever written. I read that Khalil Gibran carried the manuscript around with him for four long years, and refined it constantly before giving it to his publisher, just so it was pure art. I still remember the exact words he spoke when he was interviewed by a journalist about his creative process, because they guide me a lot when I'm in the studio. His words keep me reaching for a greater power as an artist, even though I battle procrastination a lot. Like I said, I'm pretty good, but I know I can be great. If I could just beat my self-sabotage and my demons. What did he say? asked the homeless man, now standing and twiddling with his big watch. Beads of perspiration meandered down his angular face. Here's exactly what he said, mentioned the artist. I wanted to be sure, very sure, that every word of it was the very best I had to offer. Gnarly, replied the homeless man. That's the standard that the best ones always hold themselves to. Abruptly, the spellbinder could be heard coughing in the audio. His comments that followed seemed to struggle out of him, like an unborn child, fiercely reluctant to leave the security of its loving mother's warm and safe womb. Anyone can become an everyday leader by showing up as I'm encouraging. When it's easy, and especially when it's difficult. Starting today. And if you do so, a guaranteed victory is in your future. And I need to add that there's not one person alive today who cannot lift their thinking, performance, vitality, prosperity, and lifetime happiness magnificently by wiring in a series of profound daily rituals and then practicing them until they become your second nature. And this brings me to the single most important principle of my talk, the greatest starting point for winning in your work and making a splendid life is joining what I call the 5 a.m. club. How can you ever be world class if you don't carve out some time each morning to make yourself world class? The entrepreneur was now taking notes with a ferocious intensity not previously seen. The artist's face had a this-makes-me-feel-strong smile on it. The homeless man burped, then got down to the floor and held a plank, the kind fitness pros at the gym loved to do to build a strong core. You could hear the spellbinder begin to cough even more fiercely. A brutal and sustained pause followed. Next, he uttered these words, haltingly. He was wheezing audibly. His voice began to quiver like a novice telemarketer on her very first sales call. Rising at five a.m. truly is the mother of all routines. Joining the five a.m. club is the one behavior that raises every other human behavior. This regimen is the ultimate needle mover to turn you into an undefeatable model of possibility. The way you begin your day really does determine the extent of focus, energy, excitement, and excellence you bring to it. Each early morning is a page in the story that becomes your legacy. Each new dawn is a fresh chance to unleash your brilliance, unprison your potency, and play in the big leagues of iconic results. You have such power within you, and it reveals itself most with the first rays of daybreak. Please, do not allow past pains and present frustrations to diminish your glory, stifle your invincibility, and choke the unlimited possibilitarian that lurks within the supreme part of you. In a world that seeks to keep you down, build yourself up. In an epic that wishes you would stay in the dark, step into your light. At a time that mesmerizes you to forget your gifts, reclaim your genius. 
Our world requires this of each of us, to be champions of our crafts, warriors for our growth and guardians of unconditional love for all of humankind. Display respect and compassion for all other people who occupy this tiny planet, regardless of their creed, color, or caste. Lift them up in a civilization where many get energy tearing others down. Help others sense the marvels that sleep within them. Show us the virtues we all wish more would practice. Everything I'm saying will speak to the unspoiled part of you, that side of yourself that was ferociously alive before you were taught to fear, hoard, contract, and distrust. It's your job as a hero of your life, as a creative achiever set to change the culture, and as a citizen of Earth to find this dimension within you. And once done to spend the rest of your days reconnected with it. Accept this opportunity to human mastery, and I promise you that a synchronicity of success as well as an orchestrated magic well beyond the boundaries of logic will infuse the remainder of your days. And the larger angels of your grandest potential will begin to visit you regularly. Actually, an orderly series of seemingly impossible miracles will descend onto your most genuine of dreams, causing the best of them to come true. And you will evolve into one of those rare and great spirits who upgrade the whole world by the simple act of walking amongst us. The conference hall was now dark. The entrepreneur let out a sigh the size of Mexico City. The artist was motionless. The homeless man began to cry. He then stood on a chair, raised his arms like a preacher, and boomed these words of Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me, it is a sort of splendid torch which I have got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. The homeless man then fell to his knees, kissed his holy beads, and continued to weep. Chapter 5 A Bizarre Adventure into Morning Mastery Everyone holds his fortune in his own hands. Like a sculptor, the raw material he will fashion into a figure. The skill to mold the material into what we want must be learned and attentively cultivated. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe If you two are interested, said the homeless man, I'd be happy to spend a few mornings coaching you at my Oceanside compound. I'll show you my private morning routine— and explain why dialing in the way you run your first hour to the highest degree is essential for personal mastery and exceptional business performance. Let me do this for you, cats. Your lives will start to look glorious within a fairly short time, and the ride with me will be fun. Not always easy, as we heard from the old guy on the stage, but valuable and prolific and beautiful. Maybe even as wonderful as the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. First time I saw it, I cried, the artist said, stroking the hairs of his goatee. Michelangelo was a bad dude, and I mean that in a good way, the homeless man offered as he too played with his beard, which was soiled. He then raised his shirt to show Greek god abdominal muscles. A long finger of a grimy hand moved along the contours, 
the way a raindrop zigzags down the stem of a rose after a May shower. Hit me with a stick, shouted the artist with the enthusiasm of a cat let loose in a parrot shop. How the heck did you get those? Not from some plastic ab machine I bought from a late-night TV show, that's for sure. Work is how I got all lean and chiseled up like this. Plenty of push-ups, pull-ups, planks, sit-ups, and seriously sweaty cardio sessions, often on my special beach. Without allowing for any response from his two listeners, the disheveled drifter kept on speaking. Commitment, discipline, patience, and work— Values few believe in these days, where so many have an entitlement mentality, expecting a rich, productive, and fulfilling life to just show up one day like a sparrow at the beginning of spring, and expecting everyone around them to invest the effort they are responsible for inputting. Where's the leadership in this way of operating? A society of adults behaving like spoiled little children is how I sometimes see our world right now. Not judging, just saying— not complaining, just reporting. Hey, cats, here's the point I'm trying to make by letting you have a peek at my sculpted abs. Nothing works for those who don't do the work. Less talk and more do is what I say. Oh, and check this out. The hobo spun around and unbuttoned his hole-ridden shirt. On his firm, striated back was a tattoo with the words, Victims love entertainment. Victors adore education. Come hang with me at my place on a magical little island in the middle of a fantastic ocean, five hours from the coast of Cape Town. He handed the entrepreneur the plastic card with the seaside scene etched on it. Those are my dolphins, he said, happily pointing to the hand-drawn image. The trip will be so worth it, he continued. The adventure of a lifetime, for sure. Some of your most valuable and sensational moments ever will unfold there. You need to take a trust walk with me, people. I'll teach you everything I know about a world-class morning ritual. I'll help you both become members of the 5 a.m. club. You'll learn to rise early, regularly, so you'll get more done by noon than most people get done in a week. And so you'll optimize your health, happiness, and peacefulness. There's a reason so many of the great achievers of the world get up before the sun. It's the most special part of the day. I'll explain how I used this revolutionary method to build my empire. And to be clear, empires arrive in many forms. Economic is just one of them. You can also create empires of artistry, productivity, humanity, philanthropy, personal freedom, and even spirituality. I'll download pretty much everything I've been blessed to have been taught by the mentor who transformed my life. You'll discover so much. You'll be moved at the deepest level. You'll see the world through an all-new set of lenses. You'll also eat the finest food and watch the most spectacular sunsets. You guys can swim in the sea, go snorkeling with the dolphins, and fly over the sugar cane stalks that dance in the wind in the helicopter I own. And should you both accept my heartfelt invitation to visit me, I insist you stay at my home. My God, you're kidding me, right? boomed the artist. It was becoming increasingly evident that, like many in his field, he was acutely emotional, vigilant to the infinitesimal, and carried a sensitivity born of latent pain. Those who feel more than most people sometimes believe they have been cursed. In fact, they have been granted a gift, one that allows them to sense what others miss, experience the delights that most neglect, and notice the majesty in ordinary moments. Yes, such people get hurt more easily, yet they are also the ones who create great symphonies, architect dazzling buildings, and find cures for the sick. Tolstoy once noted that only people who are capable of loving strongly can suffer great sorrow. While the Sufi poet Rumi wrote, You have to keep breaking your heart until it opens. The artist seemed to personify these insights. Nope, totally serious, dudes, the homeless man said enthusiastically. I have a house not far from a village called Solitude, and believe me, they named it accurately. It's only when you get away from the noise and nuisance and be in quiet and tranquility that you remember who and all you're truly meant to be. 
Just say yes to life and let's do this. Like the guru on the platform said, a magic will show up for you the more you start exploiting the terrific opportunities that appear along your path. Seemingly by accident, you can't win a game you don't play, right? The reality is that life has got your back, even when it doesn't look like it does. But you need to do your part and go all in when windows of opportunity appear. Oh, and if you come to my home on the island, the only thing I ask is that you stay long enough for me to teach you the philosophy and methodology that my secret advisor shared with me. Joining the 5 a.m. club requires a little time. The homeless man paused before adding, I'm also going to take care of all your expenses. Everything's covered. I'll even send my private jet to pick you guys up, if that's cool. The entrepreneur and the artist glanced at each other, amused, confounded, and entirely uncertain. Mind if my friend and I have a few moments alone, brother? requested the artist, notebook still in hand. No sweat, sure. Take all the time you need. I'll just go back to my seat over there and make some calls to my executive team, mentioned the homeless man as he paced away. This is absurd. Just asinine, the artist said to the entrepreneur. I def agree with you that there's something special about him, maybe even something magical. I know how insane that sounds, and I am fascinated by this mentor he keeps talking about, this teacher who sort of sounds like a modern-day master. I'll admit that this street person has got some great insights, for sure, and he obviously seems to have a lot of experience. But just look at him. And the guy looks completely down and out, a complete mess. I don't think he's had a shower in weeks. His clothes are all ripped. He's beyond freaky. And sometimes he talks total crazy talk. We have no idea who he is. This could be dangerous. He could be dangerous. Yes, definitely super weird. Everything that's happened here today is super weird, confirmed his companion. The entrepreneur's lean face then softened. Her eyes still seemed melancholic, though. I'm at a place in my life where I need to make some big changes, she confided. I just can't keep going on like this. I hear what you're saying. I've been suspicious of pretty much everyone and everything ever since I lost my dad when I was eleven. A daughter growing up without a father is incredibly scary. To be honest... I still carry a lot of the emotional trauma with me. I think of him every day. I've had some bad, intimate relationships. I've struggled a lot with low self-worth and made some horrible choices in the relationships I've had. About a year ago, I started seeing a therapist who made me aware of why I was behaving the way I was behaving. The entrepreneur continued. Psychologists call it fatherless daughter syndrome. Deep within, I had a huge fear of abandonment and all the strong insecurities that come with that wound. Yes, this made me extraordinarily tough on the outside, and ruthless in some ways. The chip on my shoulder over the loss of my father gave me my drive and my ambition, yet the loss also left me empty within. I'm learning that I've been trying to fill the void that he left when he left, by pushing myself to exhaustion in my work with the belief that when I'm even more successful, I'll get the love I lost. I've been attempting to fill my emotional holes by chasing more money like a heroin addict needing a fix. I've been starving for social status and hungry for industry approval, escaping online for quick pleasure hits of entertainment when I could be doing things that matter. As I said... I'm realizing a lot of my behavior has been pushed from the fear created by my early challenges as a young woman. I felt inspired when the spellbinder spoke about never doing something for the money, but, instead, reaching for world class as a leader and a person for the meaning it provides, for the opportunity to grow it provokes, and for a shot at changing the world. His words made me feel so hopeful— I want to live in the way he spoke of, but I'm nowhere near that place now, and recently, what's happened at my company pushed me to the edge. I'm really not doing well at life right now. I only came to this meeting because my mom gave me a free ticket, and I'm so desperate for a change. 
The entrepreneur took a deep breath. Sorry, she apologized, looking embarrassed. I hardly know you, so I'm not sure why I'm revealing all this to you. I guess I just feel safe with you. I'm not sure why. I'm so sorry if I'm oversharing. No problem, said the artist. His body language showed he was engaged. He no longer anxiously played with his goatee and dreadlocks. We're so honest when we chat with taxi drivers and other people we don't really know, right? The entrepreneur went on. All I'm trying to say is that I'm ready for a transformation. And my gut tells me this down-and-out man who wants to teach us how an excellent morning routine can build creative, productive, financial, and happiness empires really can help me. And help us. And, she added, remember his watch. I like him, said the artist. He's a character. I love that he expresses himself so poetically sometimes and so passionately at others. He thinks so vividly and quotes George Bernard Shaw like his life depended on it. Really cool. But I still don't really trust him, the artist expressed as he punched a fist into an open palm again. Probably ripped the watch off some rich idiot. Look, I understand how you're feeling, responded the entrepreneur. A lot of me feels the same way, and you and I just met as well. I'm not sure what it would be like to go on this trip with you. I hope you don't mind me saying that. You seem like such a nice person. A few rough edges, maybe. I think I understand where those come from. But you're good deep down. I know it. The artist looked mildly pleased. He glanced at the homeless man, who was eating slices of avocado from a plastic bag. I'll have to see if I can arrange my schedule to be away from the office so we can spend time with him, shared the entrepreneur, as she pointed to the homeless man. While he was munching on his snack, he was also talking on a relic of a mobile phone and staring at the ceiling. I'm starting to like the idea of spending some time near a village called Solitude on some tiny island, eating fabulous food and swimming with wild dolphins. I'm beginning to feel this will be a phenomenal adventure. I'm starting to feel more alive again. Well, now that you say it that way, I'm liking the sound of this, too, said the artist. I'm beginning to think there's a delicious insanity to all of this, a special opportunity to access a whole new universe of originality. This might be the best thing yet for my art. It makes me think of what the writer Charles Bukowski said. Some people never go crazy. What truly horrible lives they must lead. And the Spellbinder did encourage us to leave the boundaries of our normal lives so we grow into our gifts, talents, and strengths. Some instinct is also telling me to do this. So if you go, I'll go. Well, you know what? I'll take the leap. It's done. I'm all in. Let's go, pronounced the entrepreneur. All in, agreed the artist. They both stood up and made their way to the homeless man, who was now sitting with his eyes closed. What are you doing now? quizzed the artist. Intense visualization of all I want to be and the higher order life I wish to create? A Turkish fighter pilot once told me that before every flight, he'd fly before we'd fly. He was suggesting that meticulously rehearsing the way he and his team wanted the mission to unfold in the theater of his imagination set them up to execute that vision of mastery in reality, flawlessly. Your mindset is an enormously potent tool for private greatness, prodigious productivity and creative victory, along with your heart set, health set, and soul set. I'll teach you all about these remarkable concepts if you accept my invitation— Anywho, back to why I close my eyes. Nearly every morning, I envision my ideal performance for the day ahead. I also reach deep into my emotions, so I feel what it will feel like when I achieve the wins I've planned to accomplish. I lock myself into an extremely confident state, where any form of failure isn't within the realm of possibility. Then I go out and do my finest to live out that perfect day. Interesting. The entrepreneur was fascinated. This is just one of the SOPs I run daily to stay on peak. 
Good science is confirming that this practice helps me upregulate my genome by turning on genes that were previously asleep. Your DNA isn't your destiny, you know? Not to worry, cats. You'll learn about the breakthrough field of epigenetics when you're on the island. You'll also learn some beautiful neuroscience on multiplying your success in this age of scattered attention. So the weapons of mass distraction don't destroy your amazingness. I'll reveal everything I've discovered about creating projects that are so masterfully done, they endure for generations. You'll hear about fabulous ways to armor plate your mental focus and fireproof your physical energy. You'll discover how the best business people in the world build dominant enterprises and learn a calibrated system that the most joyful human beings on the planet apply each morning to create a life that borders on the magical. Oh, in case you were wondering, an SOP is a standard operating procedure. It's a term my special advisor used when he'd speak about the daily structures needed to find triumph at the game of life. I assume you two are coming? Yes, we're coming, confirmed the entrepreneur in an upbeat tone. Thank you for your offer. Yeah, thanks, man, added the artist, now looking more composed. Please, the entrepreneur said earnestly, teach us everything you know about creating the morning routine of a high-impact leader and a supremely successful business person. I desperately want to improve my performance and my daily productivity, I'll also need your help to restructure my life. To be honest, I'm feeling more inspired today than I felt in a long time. But I'm not in the best place. Yeah, brother, said the artist. Tell us your secrets for an epic morning routine that helps me become the best painter and man I can become. He waved his notebook in the air as he spoke. Send us your plane. Take us to your village. Give us some coconuts. Let us ride your dolphins and improve our lives. We're all in. None of what you'll discover will be motivation, noted the scraggly soul with a degree of seriousness he hadn't shown before. All of this will definitely be about transformation, and it will be supported by strong data, the latest research and immensely practical tactics that have been battle-tested in the tough trenches of industry. Get ready for the greatest adventure you cats will ever experience. Excellent, declared the entrepreneur, as she reached out to shake the weather-beaten stranger's hand. I need to admit that this entire scenario has been extremely odd for both of us, but for whatever reason. We now trust you. And, yes, we're totally open to this new experience. You're very kind to do this for us, thank you, blurted out the artist. He looked somewhat surprised by the extent of his graciousness. Awesome! Smart decision, guys, came the warm response. Please be outside this conference center tomorrow morning. Bring at least a few days' worth of clothes, that's all. Like I said, I'm stoked to take care of everything else. All expenses are on me. I thank you. Why are you thanking us? wondered the entrepreneur. The homeless man smiled tenderly and scratched his beard thoughtfully. In his final sermon before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. said, Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. The tramp wiped a morsel of avocado from the edge of his mouth and then carried on what he was saying. One of the big lessons I've learned over the years is that giving to other people is a gift you give to yourself. Raise the joy of others, and you'll get even more joy. Increase the state of your fellow human beings, and, naturally, your own state of being ascends. Success is cool, but significance is rad. Generosity, not scarcity, is the trait of all the great men and women who have upgraded our world. And we need leaders— Pure leaders, and not narcissists obsessed with their own self-interests, as never before. The homeless man looked down at his large watch one last time. 
You can't take your title, net worth, and fancy toys with you when you die, you know? I've yet to see a moving truck following a hearse on its way to a funeral, he chuckled. The two listeners grinned. He's a treasure, whispered the entrepreneur. Deaf is, acknowledged the artist. Stop saying deaf so much, said the entrepreneur. It's getting irritating. The artist looked a little shocked. Okay. All that matters on your last day on Earth is the potential you've leveraged, the heroism you've demonstrated, and the human lives you've graced, the homeless man said eloquently. He then grew quiet and let out a deep breath. Anywho, incredible that you're coming. We'll have a cool hang. May I bring my paintbrushes? The artist asked politely. Only if you want to paint in paradise, came the homeless man's reply with a wink. And what time should we meet outside this place tomorrow morning? Asked the entrepreneur, placing her handbag onto a thin, bony shoulder. Five a.m., instructed the homeless man. Own your morning. Elevate your life. Then he disappeared. Chapter 6 A Flight to Peak Productivity, Virtuosity, and Undefeatability Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Steve Jobs I'm so tired, the entrepreneur muttered with the energy of an ancient turtle on a vacation day, while holding a monstrous cup of coffee. This journey might be harder than I thought. I'm starting to feel like I'm walking into a whole new world. Like I told you yesterday after the seminar, I'm definitely ready to change, set for a new beginning. But I'm also feeling uneasy about all this. I didn't sleep much last night. Such eerie and sometimes violent dreams. And, yes, this experience we've agreed to might be dangerous. Well, I feel like death, man, said the artist. I hate being up this early. This was a terrible idea. The two brave souls were standing on the sidewalk outside the hall where the spellbinder had worked his legendary skills and broken many hearts with his collapse the day before. It was 4.49 a.m. He won't show up, barked the artist roughly. He was dressed in black with a ruby-red polka-dotted bandana on his left wrist. Same boots as yesterday, those Australian ones. He hurled a mouthful of spit into the desolate street. He squinted at the sky, and then he folded his tattooed arms. The entrepreneur had a nylon duffel bag over her shoulder. She styled a silk blouse with bohemian sleeves, designer blue jeans and a pair of sandals with high heels, the kind you see off-duty supermodels with sunglasses the size of Greek island sunsets wearing. Her lips were scrunched together, and the lines on her face were arrayed in a series of interesting intersections. I bet the homeless man's a no-show, she said with a sneer. I don't care about his watch. It doesn't matter that he could be so articulate. It means nothing to me now that he reminded me of my dad. God, I'm exhausted. He was probably at the seminar because he needed a place to rest for a few hours. He probably knew about the whole 5 a.m. club morning routine because he heard and stole that bit of the Spellbinder's presentation. And the private plane he talked about was probably part of his favorite hallucination. The entrepreneur had returned to her familiar skepticism and hiding within her fortress of protection. The hopefulness of the day before had clearly dissolved. Just then, a pair of strikingly powerful halogen headlights pierced the wall of darkness. The two companions looked at each other. The entrepreneur managed to smile. Okay, maybe instinct really is much smarter than reason, she muttered to herself. A gleaming Rolls-Royce the color of coal 
pulled up to the curb. With swift efficiency, a man in a crisp white uniform leapt out of the sedan and greeted the two with old-school civility. "'Good morning to you, madam, and to you as well, sir,' he enunciated in a British accent, as he placed their bags into the vehicle with one skillful swoop. "'Where's the derelict?' asked the artist with the tact of a hillbilly who'd never left the woods. The driver couldn't help but laugh. Quickly he regained his composure. So sorry, sir. Yes, Mr. Riley dresses in very unassuming attire, shall we say. He does that when he feels the need to get gritty, as he classifies the practice. He leads a remarkably exclusive life most of the time, and is a man accustomed to getting anything he wants. Everything he wants, to be more precise. So, once in a while, he does things to ensure his modesty and humility remain in check. That's part of his quirky charm, I might add. Mr. Riley asked me to give these to you. The driver pulled out two envelopes, made of the highest quality paper. On opening them, the entrepreneur and the artist saw these words. Hey, cats, hope you're awesome. Didn't mean to spook you both yesterday. I just needed to keep my boots on the ground. Epictetus, one of my favorite philosophers, wrote, But neither a bull nor a noble-spirited man comes to be what he is all at once. He must undertake hard winter training, and prepare himself and not propel himself rashly into what is not appropriate to him. Voluntary discomfort, whether by dressing as I did or by fasting once a week, or by sleeping on the floor once a month, keeps me strong, disciplined, and focused on the central few priorities my life's built around. Anywho, have a tremendous flight, and I'll see you in paradise soon. Big hug. The driver continued, Please remember that appearances can be misleading, and clothing doesn't convey one's character. Yesterday you met a great man. Looks really do not reveal the quality of a person. I guess neither does shaving, proclaimed the artist, kicking a black boot against the shiny Rolls-Royce symbol at the center of one of the wheels. Mr. Riley would never tell you what I'm about to tell you, as he's far too courteous and decent. But the gentleman you refer to as a derelict happens to be one of the wealthiest people in the world. Are you serious? asked the entrepreneur, her eyes widening. I most certainly am. The driver smiled politely as he opened a door, waving a white-gloved hand to welcome both passengers into the vehicle. The seats had that marvelously musky smell of new leather. The wood paneling seemed like it had been prepared by hand, by a small family of finicky craftspeople who'd built their reputations around this singular obsession. Mr. Riley made his fortune many years ago in various commercial ventures. He was also an early investor in what has now become an internationally admired company. Discretion prevents me from mentioning the name, and if Mr. Riley found out I was speaking of financial matters with you, he'd be exceedingly disappointed. His instructions were simply to treat you with the utmost of care, along with assuring you of his sincerity and reliability, and to deliver you safely to Hangar 21. Hangar 21? the artist asked as he eased languidly into the opulent vehicle like a rock star accustomed to this method of transport, or a hip-hop artist ready for a weekend roll. That's where Mr. Riley's fleet of jets are kept, stated the driver succinctly. Fleet? questioned the entrepreneur, her beautiful brown eyes alive with an immensely curious look. Yes, was all the chauffeur would allow. There was silence as the driver sped through the early morning streets. The artist looked out the window while rolling a bottle of water in one hand absent-mindedly. He hadn't seen the sun rising in many years. Very special. Truly beautiful, he admitted. Everything so peaceful at this time of the day. No noise. Such peace. Even though I feel tired right now, I can really think. Things seem clearer. My attention isn't a mess. It feels like the rest of the world is asleep. What tranquility. A cavalry of wispy amber rays, the ethereal palette of the daybreak, and the quietude of this moment left him encouraged and awestruck. The entrepreneur studied the driver. 
So tell me more about your boss, she requested, restlessly toying with her device as she spoke. I can't tell you much more. He's worth multiple billions of dollars. He's given most of his money to charity. Mr. Riley's the most fascinating, generous, and compassionate person I know. He also has incredible willpower, along with having ironclad values, such as honesty, empathy, integrity, and loyalty. And, of course, he's also a real oddball, if I may be so bold as to say so, like a lot of the very, very, very rich. We've noticed, agreed the entrepreneur. I'm interested, though. What makes you say he's odd? You'll see, was the stark response. The Rolls soon arrived at a private airport. No sign of Mr. Riley. The driver accelerated up to an ivory jet that looked immaculately kept. The only color it bore appeared on the tail, in the hue of a mandarin orange. Three characters read, 5AC. What does 5AC stand for? asked the entrepreneur tensely, gripping her gadget tightly. The 5 a.m. club. Own your morning, elevate your life. It's one of the maxims Mr. Riley has conducted his many business interests under. And now, with regret, this is where I must bid you adieu. Au revoir, he said before carrying the luggage over to the sparkling aircraft. Two handsome crew members chatted near the metal stairway that led up to the cabin. A tastefully refined blonde flight attendant handed the entrepreneur and the artist hot towels and offered them coffee from a silver tray. Dobro ya utro, she said, greeting them in Russian. It has been a great pleasure to meet you, the driver called up to the jet as he got back into the car. Kindly convey my best wishes to Mr. Riley once you see him, and do have fun in Mauritius. Mauritius, the companions exclaimed, as surprised as a vampire waking up to a garlic clove. This is all unbelievable, the artist said as he climbed into the cabin. Mauritius, I've always wanted to go to that island, and I've read a bit about it. It's a high-frequency place. French flavor, tremendous beauty. And from what they say, many of the warmest and happiest people on Earth live there. I'm blown away, too, the entrepreneur said as she sipped her coffee and peeked into the cockpit. She studied the pilots as they performed their pre-flight preparation. I've also heard Mauritius is splendid, and that the people are super friendly, helpful, and spiritually advanced. After a perfect takeoff, the first-class plane floated high into the clouds. Once at cruising altitude, premium champagne was served, caviar was recommended, and an array of fabulous main courses were suggested. The entrepreneur was feeling fairly content and far less incited by the cruel attempt of her investors to take her company away from her. True, this might not be the ideal time to take a vacation to learn about the 5 a.m. club philosophy and its underlying methodology that had served Mr. Riley's ascent to business titan and global philanthropists like rocket fuel. Or perhaps this was the perfect time to get away from her usual reality— to discover how the most successful, influential, and joyful people on the planet start their days. After sipping on some champagne, the entrepreneur watched a movie. She then fell into a deep sleep. The artist had a book called Michelangelo Fiorentino e Raphael da Urbino, Masters of Art in the Vatican. He read it for hours. You can just imagine how happy he felt. The jet made its trajectory over a number of vast continents and above varied terrain. The flight was meticulously conducted, and the landing was as fluid as the overall experience was fine. Bienvenue, Royal Maurice, announced the captain over the public address system as the aircraft taxied along the freshly paved runway. Merci beaucoup. Welcome to Mauritius and Sir Siwasugur Ramgulam International Airport, he continued speaking his words with the well-earned confidence of someone who had spent most of his life in the sky. It's been a privilege having you two VIPs with us. We'll see you again in several days. From what Mr. Riley's personal assistant has informed us of your itinerary, thank you once again for flying with us, and we trust that the journey was elegant, excellent, and above all else, safe. A polished black SUV glittered on the tarmac, 
as the flight attendant escorted her special passengers off the plane and into the humming vehicle. Your luggage will follow shortly. Not to worry. It shall be delivered to your guest rooms at Mr. Riley's Seaside Estates. Spasiba, she added in a graceful tone and with an earnest wave. This is so A-list, observed the entrepreneur, as she happily snapped some selfies, uncharacteristically pouting like a fashionista. Deaf, replied the artist, as he photobombed her, sticking out his tongue like Albert Einstein did in that famous photo that betrayed his seriousness as a scientist and revealed his undiminished childlike sense of wonder. As the Range Rover rolled along the highway, tall stalks of sugar cane swayed in the fragrant breezes blown by the Indian Ocean. The quiet chauffeur wore a white cap, the kind you see bellmen at five-star hotels wearing, and a well-pressed dark gray uniform that hinted at an understated yet refined professionalism. He never missed slowing down when the speed limit descended and ensuring his signal light was on whenever a turn was to be made. Though it was evident that the man was older, he moved the vehicle along the roadway with the precision of a young apprentice, dedicated to becoming the absolute best. Through the drive, his focus remained transfixed on the pavement ahead, in a sort of trance designed to keep his passengers secure, yet deliver them to their destination with a smooth efficiency. They passed through some tiny villages that had a timeless feel. Bougainvillea lined the streets. Wild dogs with king-of-the-road demeanor stood at the meridian line, confronting the SUV in a deadly game of chicken, and children played on small grassy lawns with thoughtless abandon. Roosters could be heard shrieking from time to time, and old men in basic woolen hats with tooth-missing mouths and chestnut-colored skin sat on weather-beaten wooden chairs. They looked like they had too many hours to pass in the day, at once tired from life's hardships and yet wise from days fully lived. Choirs of upbeat birds sang melodically, while colorful butterflies seemed to be fluttering everywhere. In one tiny community, the SUV snaked through. A skinny boy with legs that appeared too long for his body pedaled a banana bike with a seat that was set too high on its creaky metal frame. In another, a group of teenaged girls in tank tops, surf shorts and flip-flops, shuffled along the narrow but attentively maintained road, following a man in army green cargo shorts wearing a T-shirt that had the number one flame-grilled chicken printed on the back of it. Everything seemed to move on island time. People looked cheerful. They beamed with a radiant vitality, not so commonly seen in the overscheduled machine-dominated and sometimes soulless lives so many among us are experiencing. The beaches were unspeakably beautiful, the gardens were entirely glorious, and the entire Gongon-looking scene was draped by a series of mountains that looked like they'd been carved by a sixteenth-century Florentine sculptor. "'See that structure up there?' the driver said, breaking his self-imposed silence and pointing to a rock formation at the top of one of the peaks that resembled a human figure. That's called Peter Bot. It's the second highest mountain in Mauritius. See the summit up there? It resembles a human head, right? He noted with a finger pointed upward at the structure. It definitely does, responded the artist. When we were in elementary school, the chauffeur continued, we were told the story of a man who fell asleep at the foot of the mountain— Hearing strange sounds, he woke up to see fairies and angels dancing all about him. These creatures instructed the man never to tell anyone what he had just seen, or he would be turned to stone. He agreed, but then, given his excitement over the mystical experience he'd witnessed, broke his commitment and told many of his good fortune. Upset, the fairies and angels turned him to rock, and his head swelled to such a degree it rose to sit at the peak of the majestic mountain you both are looking at now, reminding everyone who sees it to keep their promises and honor their word. The SUV meandered past another community. Music played from a small loudspeaker on a front porch, as two teenaged boys and three teenaged girls with white and pink flowers in their hair danced gleefully. Another dog barked modestly in the background. 
Great story, noted the entrepreneur. Her window was open, and her wavy brown hair flitted in the wind. Her usually lined face now appeared completely smooth. She enunciated her words more slowly now. An unprecedented peacefulness emerged from her voice. One of her hands rested on the seat, not so far from where a hand of the artist, which bore finely etched tattoos on its middle and index fingers, lay. Mark Twain wrote, Mauritius was made first, and then heaven, and heaven copied Mauritius, the driver shared, now warming up after being somewhat steely. He beamed as proudly as a president on Inauguration Day after saying what he'd just said. Never seen anything like this, the artist said, his goth meets angry man hostility, now replaced with a more untroubled, carefree and relaxed demeanor. And the vibe I feel here is stirring something deeply creative inside of me. The entrepreneur glanced at the artist for a little longer than was politely acceptable. Then she looked away, out at the sea. Though reluctant, she couldn't help but smile gently. The driver could be heard whispering into the SUV speakerphone. Five minutes away. Then he handed each of his passengers a handcrafted tablet that seemed made of gold. Please study these, he told them. Engraved finely in the apparently precious metal were five statements. Rule number one. An addiction to distraction is the end of your creative production. Empire makers and history creators take one hour for themselves before dawn. In the serenity that lies beyond the clutches of complexity to prepare themselves for a world-class day. Rule number two. Excuses breed no genius. Just because you haven't installed the early rising habit before doesn't mean you can't do it now. Release your rationalizations, and remember that small daily improvements, when done consistently over time, lead to stunning results. Rule number three. All change is hard at first, messy in the middle, and gorgeous at the end. Everything you now find easy, you first found difficult. With consistent practice, getting up with the sun will become your new normal. And automatic. Rule number four. To have the results the top 5% of producers have, you must start doing what 95% of people are unwilling to do. As you start to live like this, the majority will call you crazy. Remember that being labeled a freak is the price of greatness. Rule number five. When you feel like surrendering, continue. Triumph loves the relentless. The vehicle slowed to a crawl as it passed an orderly row of faded white beach houses. A compact pickup truck was parked in the dusty driveway of one house. Dive gear was strewn across the front yard of another. In front of the last house, a gaggle of kids played in a yard, laughing hysterically as they enjoyed their game. The ocean appeared, both greenish and bluish with foam-topped waves making shashing sounds before colliding with the sandy shore. The air now smelled a marine life smell, yet sweet like nectar with unexpected cinnamon hints blended into it. On a wide planked dock, a thin line of a man with a Santa Claus beard and rolled up khakis fished barefoot for his family's dinner. A motorcycle helmet was perched on his old head. The sun was beginning to set, a glamorous sphere of blinding radiance that cast liquid yellow streaks and reflections on the welcoming water that lay before it. Birds still chirped, butterflies still flew. Quite magical, all of this. We're here, announced the chauffeur into an intercom perched beside a metal fence that seemed to have been erected more to keep wildlife out than to prevent interlopers from getting in. The gate opened, slowly. The SUV rolled down a winding road teeming with bougainvillea, hibiscus, frangipani, and bucoldurel, the national flower of Mauritius, along the sides. The driver opened his window, inviting in a sea breeze, carrying a swirling scent that also included fresh jasmine mixed with rich roses. 
Gardeners in smart gardening attire waved sincere waves. One shouted, Bonjour, as a vehicle sailed by. Another said, Bonjour, as two fat doves the size of a trucker's fist hopped along a stone path. The billionaire's house was low-key. The design was of the beachfront chic sort, kind of a Martha's Vineyard cottage meets Swedish farmhouse feel. It was both sensationally beautiful and completely private. A massive veranda at the back of the home extended over the ocean. A muddy mountain bike leaned against a wall. A surfboard rested near the end of the driveway. Massive floor-to-ceiling windows were the only extravagant architectural flourish. More precious flowers were meticulously arranged along a deck, where a trolley supporting hors d'oeuvres, assorted cheeses, and a service of fresh lemon tea with precisely cut slices of ginger waited. Sun-bleached gray steps wound down to a breathtakingly lovely beach, the type seen in the travel magazines the elite crowd liked to read. Amid all this exquisiteness, an isolated figure stood on the milk-colored sand. He made not one movement. Perfect stillness. The man was Eiffel Tower tall, shirtless and bronzed, and sporting a pair of loose shorts with a camouflage pattern. Canary yellow sandals and uber-stylish sunglasses, the kind you might purchase on Via de Condotti in Rome, completed the surfer Zen meets Soho swagger appearance. He peered out into the sea, remaining still as a star in the big African sky. There, said the entrepreneur, pointing. We finally get to see our host, the illustrious Mr. Riley, she noted energetically, picking up her pace as she hustled down the wooden stairs that led to the seashore. Look at him. He's just hanging out by the water, soaking up those rays and totally loving life. Told you he's special. So happy I trusted my gut and agreed to this wonderful escapade. He's been true to his word. In a world where too many people say things they never do and make promises they fail to keep, he's been super consistent. He's treated us so well. He doesn't even know us, and yet he's really trying to help us. Zero doubt in my mind he's got our backs. Hurry up, will you? She urged her slow-moving companion as she waved an encouraging hand. I feel like giving Mr. Riley a giant hug. The artist laughed as a baby gecko Jay walked across a broad plank. He took off his black shirt in the dazzling sunshine, exposing a Buddha-sized belly and man breasts the size of fleshy mangoes. Me too. He does walk his preach. Man, I need to get some sun, the painter murmured as he sped up to stay close to the entrepreneur. He breathed hard. As the two guests walked toward the man at the water's edge of this nirvana of an ocean compound, they observed there were no other houses in sight, not even one, just a few wooden fishing boats with paint peeled off from the passage of years moored in the shallow waters near the shore. And aside from the sun-worshipping empire builder in Italian shades, there was no other human being in evidence, anywhere. Mr. Riley, shouted the artist, now on the sand, hungrily sucking air into his extraordinarily unfit lungs. The slender figure remained as fixed as a palace guard, awaiting the arrival of the royal motorcade. Mr. Riley, echoed the entrepreneur passionately. No response. The man just kept looking out at the sea, and at container ships the size of football stadiums that sat sprinkled across the horizon. The artist soon stood behind the set of intensely tanned shoulders of the figure, and tapped three times on the left one. Instantly, the figure spun around. The two visitors gasped. The entrepreneur put a slender hand over her mouth. The artist jerked backward instinctively, before falling to the sand. Both were stunned by what they saw. It was the Spellbinder. Chapter 7 Preparation for a Transformation Begins in Paradise A child has no trouble believing the unbelievable, nor does the genius or the madman. It's only you and I, 
with our big brains and our tiny hearts, who doubt and overthink and hesitate. Stephen Pressfield Um, wow, declared the entrepreneur with a crooked smile that displayed part surprise and part delight. We were at your seminar. Um, you were brilliant up on that stage, she finally managed to express, pivoting impressively from soft shock to the master of the universe business bearing she was more accustomed to. I lead a technology company. We're what pundits in our industry call a rocket ship because of the exponential growth we've been experiencing. Things were going phenomenally well until a little while ago. The entrepreneur's voice trailed off. She looked away from the spellbinder and stared at the artist. For a moment, she played nervously with her bracelets. The lines along her face became more vivid, and her visage gave off a heavy, tired, and injured look in that instant, on that spectacular beach. What happened? asked the spellbinder. To your business. Some of the people who invested in my enterprise felt I had too much equity in it. They wanted more for themselves. Super greedy people. So they manipulated my executive team, convinced key employees to rally against me, and are now trying to throw me out of the firm. That place is my whole life. The entrepreneur choked up. A school of luxuriously colored tropical fish swam through the shallow water at the edge of the sand. I was ready to take my life, she carried on, until I showed up at your seminar. Many of your nuggets of knowledge gave me hope. A lot of your words made me feel strong again. Not sure exactly what it was, but you pushed me to believe in myself and my future. I just want to thank you. She embraced the spellbinder. You've started me on the journey to optimizing my life. Thank you so much for your generous words, the spellbinder replied, appearing dramatically different from the way he looked the last time the entrepreneur and the artist saw him. Not only did he have that healthy glow people get from time in the sun, he now stood steadily and had gained a little weight. I'm grateful for what you've said the spellbinder continued. But the truth is that I didn't start you on the quest to improve your life. You are changing your life by starting the process of bringing application to my insights and methods, by implementing my teachings. So many people chat a good game. They tell you all the ambitions they're going to get done and all the aspirations they plan to deliver on. I'm not judging. I'm just reporting... I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, most people stay the same their entire lives. Too frightened to leave the way they operated yesterday, married to the complacency of the ordinary, and wedded to the shackles of conformity, while resisting all opportunity for growth, evolution, and personal elevation. So many good souls among us, are just so scared they refuse the call on their lives to go out into the blue ocean of possibility, where mastery, the dignity of bravery, and the authenticity of audacity await them. You had the wisdom to act on some of the information I shared at my event. You're one in a tiny minority of people alive today, willing to do what it takes to become a better leader, producer, and human being. Good on you. And I know transformation isn't an easy play. Yet the life of the caterpillar must end for the glory of the butterfly to shine. The old you must die before the best you can be born. You're so smart not to wait until you have ideal conditions to step up to a work world and private life of stainless excellence. Great power is unleashed with a simple start. When you begin to close the loop, opened by your utmost aspirations by making them real, a secret heroic force within you makes itself known. Nature notices your effortful actions, and then goes ahead and replies to your faithful commitment 
with a series of unanticipated wins. Your willpower heightens, your confidence climbs, and your brilliance soars. A year from now, you'll be so happy you began today. Thank you, said the entrepreneur. I heard a man say he needed to lose weight before he could start running. Imagine that. Lose the weight so he could initiate the running habit. That's like a writer who waits for inspiration to begin the book, or the manager who waits for a promotion to lead the field, or a startup that waits for full funding before launching a status quo disrupting product. The flow of life rewards positive action and punishes hesitation. Anyway, I'm thrilled I could contribute to your rise in some small way. Sounds like you're at a difficult yet exciting time on your personal adventure. Please consider that a bad day for the ego is a great day for the soul, and what your voice of fear claims is a mean season. The light of your wisdom knows is a splendid gift. We thought you were dead, the entrepreneur announced, unfiltered. Thank God you're okay, and I appreciate how humble you are. I believe the humblest is the greatest. Pure leaders are so secure in their own skin, their main mission is the elevation of others. They have such self-respect, joyfulness, and peacefulness within themselves that they don't need to advertise their success to society in a feeble attempt to feel a little better. I should also say, if I may, that there's a big difference between real power and fake power, the spellbinder explained, dropping even deeper into the guru mode that had made him so famous worldwide. Our culture tells us to pursue titles and trinkets, applause and acclaim, money and mansions. All that's fine, it truly is so long as you don't get brainwashed into defining your worth as a human being by these things. Enjoy them. Just don't get attached to them. Have them. Just don't base your identity around them. Appreciate them. Just don't need them. These are only forms of fake power our civilization programs us to believe we must pursue to be successful and serene. The fact is that should you lose any one of these things, the substitute power you derived from them evaporates, just vanishes in an instant, revealing itself as the illusion it was. Tell us more, please. The entrepreneur was absorbing every word. Real power never comes from anything external, the spellbinder continued. A lot of people with a lot of money aren't very wealthy. Take that line to the bank, stated the spellbinder, as he slipped off his bright yellow flip-flops and placed them neatly on the sugary sand. Genuine power, the stuff legends are made of, doesn't arise from who you are outside and what you possess externally. The world is lost right now. True and enduring power expresses itself when you contact your original gifts and realize your most lavish talents as a human. I should also say real riches come from living by the noble virtues of productivity, self-discipline, courage, honesty, empathy, and integrity, as well as being able to lead your days on your own terms— versus blindly following the sheep that so many in our sick society have been trained.